obviously DeFi still has one area, as you mentioned, that needs to be addressed. And I, I believe the next growth of DeFi is gonna come not just from virtual to virtual. So I believe when we tie the virtual world with the real asset world, this will take DeFi to another level. Your crypto working for you, it can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to process advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros with the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk reward ratio, but also your assets are protected by our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain boys across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the new OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, George Sebastião, the former CTO of Huawei, but also now CEO of the global blockchain organization, GBO, here with us to teach us tons of cool stuff. But before we kick off, don't forget to check out CryptoSlate, our partner, always giving you summarized version of these interviews in case you prefer the written format. So without further ado, George, thank you so much for coming on the show, it's my a, friend. It's a pleasure to be here. What a wise man you are, and I'm so excited about this interview. You're at so many conferences as a speaker, as a moderator. I see you on every poster. <laughs> no, no, I'm a very modest guy. I like to keep it low key, but yes, I am helping uh, build the community. I'm helping transfer information about the usability and the use cases of the technology. And I think we're still in the infancy of this technology. So I think the biggest rewards and the biggest utility is still to come. That is super cool. And I must ask you, I mean, you are you were CTO of Huawei, which is one of the mega tech companies of the world. And then you suddenly decided to come join this crazy crypto blockchain space. What made you want to do that leap of faith? Because, you know, there, you were already in such a great tech background. Actually, this happened within Huawei. Um, one of my big bosses in a Huawei that managed the division, I was responsible for IT and obviously Middle East is quite a big uh, geography. So about seven years ago, he asked me, please look into this uh, blockchain and maybe we can use it as a use case because obviously uh, Huawei is an engineering organization. Originally, they were only in uh, cellular towers and telecom, telecom billing systems. Eventually they moved into IT. So they were making servers, storage, cloud computing, AI. <laughs> And how do you go about and promote this technology? You need to have use cases. So one of those use cases was blockchain. And uh, more specifically, Huawei was looking at making blockchain as a service and offered within their platforms. And we were looking at things like, for example, Hyperledger and so on. But obviously nothing to do with crypto or crypto coins, or anything else. It was really blockchain as a service for enterprise organizations, which is still 
a very nascent uh, usage of blockchain. And I think a lot of growth is still happening in this area. Because typically when you write or develop a business application, what it happens to be for the private sector or for government, and you say, oh, I'm doing a blockchain application. In reality, blockchain is maybe 5 or 10% uh, of this system. The rest is full stack development. So you need a front end, a back end system, you need a workflow, you need a web interface, you need a mobile app. And then blockchain is just a little piece that you barely see and actually makes the whole thing become transparent and become trusted. As you know, uh, a place where we are here right now, Dubai, made a government strategy that all government systems must use blockchain in their infrastructure. That does not mean that tomorrow they're going to throw away all their old uh, systems. It means they're going to use blockchain to make those systems work better and uh, more efficiently. Actually, one of the interesting aspects about blockchain is that it allows the two parties to enter into a contractual agreement without any middleman. So it actually saves a lot of inefficiencies. So in the case of a government application, it saves the government a lot of costs. That's why Dubai is looking at blockchain. In the case of an enterprise, and I can give you an example from, um, let's say the largest telecom uh, organization without naming the name, they were looking at how can we use blockchain to administer the contracts with our suppliers. And one of the biggest suppliers, obviously Huawei, but also it was Lenovo and many others. And they were saying, let's say in these contracts, what is Huawei receiving? Cellular towers, maybe it's receiving mobile phones, maybe it's receiving other electronic components. But let's say you receive 1 million phones, but instead of receiving 1 million phones, you receive 900, 9,000. So you receive like 1% less. In the typical systems today, you need to do a lot of paperwork to actually do this reconciliation because in reality, you did not meet the original contract, but you need to have adjustments. The beauty is when the two parties, in this case, the telecom organization and its suppliers, sign a mutually agreed smart contract. So it means it's digital signatures. It is the equivalent of law or a mutual agreement between, very similar to the way you do it kind of in DocuSign. But DocuSign is a passive document. This is actually a document that drives the payments between those two organizations. That means you save all this back and forward uh, paperwork that needs to be done just to make adjustments. You can imagine how many of these paperwork goes back and forth just to make this. So in this case, this large telecom organization, although it may pay a few million to develop this system, is going to save hundreds of millions of dollars per year just from this system alone. So we need to look for these uh, smart, usable use cases and then apply the technology in an effective way to introduce better digitalization, better automation, and kind of uh, you know, make the systems faster, better, and save money for the, the companies and the enterprises. So that was immediately when you saw this type of, like you said, contractual agreement that's digitized and, and uh, not prone to all the areas of reconciliation. Was that kind of that inefficiency gap where you thought, okay, this has great potential? Exactly. It's a technology that is solving a real problem that we have today. Because when um, cloud computing was introduced uh, and internet by itself, the trust element was not built in. It was added as layers. Even Netscape, when it first came out, the HTTPS of uh, Netscape was added as another layer on top. It's actually, if you remember, the Gamal Exchange, actually written by Dr. Tarev Gamal. He was my boss for one year. He's now the CISO of Salesforce. So the point is, all these innovations were put as layers inside the system. With blockchain is that it's built in from the ground up. So it builds trust into the system right from the beginning. Amazing, amazing. Very well said, and it's, it's beautiful to to hear that from coming to someone who's t coming from the IT sector and the, the more traditional IT sector and, and, and framing this for the people out there, very simple to understand. Um, and you know, obviously cybersecurity is a very interesting theme for you and security, like how, like in terms of security on the blockchain, like how secure is it really? Like, you know, we all talk about, you know, this is the most secure database, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you feel, how do you see this from that lens specifically? Okay. First, I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years, about 21, 22. 
Um, I'm a mathematician, so cybersecurity was actually my passion. So when I looked at blockchain, I said, oh, I've seen this technology before. It's like PKI technology without a central authority in a decentralized way. The formulas and the mathematics of blockchain are extremely secure and have proven to be unbreakable for some platforms up to now. Maybe quantum computer may change that in a few years, but for now, it's extremely safe. What does it really mean is that blockchain does not exist by itself. So typically, when you are protecting the system, we always say this term, the system is, a, or a chain, is as strong as its weakest link. And when you build an old system, an entire system, blockchain is only a small part of that system. So any of the, although the blockchain might be extremely secure, other elements of that chain may not be secure. So that means the entire system is not secure. And that is actually the biggest problem. So what are the sources of problems? Obviously, one of the biggest source of problems when we talk about cybersecurity is always the end user. It's the end user that is actually vulnerable. Use, user is vulnerable to simple things like social engineering. So when we're doing things like a phishing attempt, whether this phishing is happening through SMS or call, we call this vishing or smishing <laughs> for SMS phishing, um, or for example, email phishing, it's all the same. It's social engineering. But guess what? When you receive an SMS and it says, for example, Binance and says, please must update your password, you will trust this SMS, it's coming to your mobile. You will not question. So that means you're being fooled into providing your credentials to a system that later on will uh, use them for other purposes. Now, it's much more complex than that. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Another area of big concern is what we call SIM swap. As you know, SIM swap is where somebody takes over your uh, mobile number. And as you know, Today, many of the exchanges and systems that deal in crypto use SMS as their authentication mechanism. The newer ones use other methods to establish extra layers of defense, but the ones that rely only on SMS, they're extremely vulnerable today. Why? Because if you grab the other person's mobile number and you take over, how do you do it? They call the mobile provider, oh, I lost my number, blah, blah, blah. And they create a big story and the guy, okay, no problem, I'll reset it for you. In reality, you have lost your SIM card until you go back to the mobile operator and get it back. That means these people are able to take over your entire digital life. It means they'll be able to reset your Gmail password, they'll be able to reset your crypto exchange passwords, and so on, regardless of, of where you are. And once they have done that, they can empty your wallets, your digital wallets. So example of issue number two. Another example as more kind of technical, for example, what we sometimes call the 51% attack. In the case of Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's very unlikely such things to happen because today the networks are so large that the cost of a sustained attack against Bitcoin would simply not be cost effective. However, in the case of smaller coins with much less amount of nodes, you can simply launch these minor nodes on a cloud platform like Amazon or others and you'll be able to take over the network, set the transactions you want, create fake transactions, empty the wallets, and uh, then restore back to its original state. By that time, the money is long gone. So this is, you can say, a third element. A fourth element is sometimes where we think things are extremely secure. As you know, uh, we are being told that if we store our keys in other types of wallets, we are more secure. We, we have different types of wallets, what we call hot wallets. These are the wallets that are in the crypto exchanges. We have warm wallets, which are wallets that are typically on our devices, um, like for example, trust wallet. And we have cold wallets, which then remove the keys from those devices and store into devices like Nano or Trezor. And then we have what we call super cold or frigid wallets, which maybe could be a piece of paper, could be a piece of metal that you store under the ground and you put on a safe. That means it has no connection whatsoever to any computer. All of these, the lower you go, the more security that you have. But in the case even of cold wallets, there has been cases where you are susceptible to attack. In some cases, there are firmware bugs in these devices. So you need to update these devices to prevent 
future attacks when those vulnerabilities have been found. In other cases, um, in one specific case, an entire database of the users of these devices was stolen from the internet and now this database is being used to fish the users of these devices. So that means they call, oh, you have a nano. We have an update to your nano. Please <laughs> update the password user ID. And then all of a sudden, they're taking over your cold wallet life and so on with the funds that you may have, regardless of the currency. But if you're using massive amounts, to give you an idea, in 2018, the amount that got stolen, this type of attacks, was in the neighborhood of $2 billion. Now, as we move forward, this looks relatively small, but it's a substantial amount um, of the funds in relationship to the percentage of the entire market. We have reached now about a trillion. We're going on two trillion, so it's getting smaller. But there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure that we have safety in this environment. So. The idea is that really we have to protect all the layers and at each of those layers, we are basically making the system safer. So that really means we need to give security awareness lessons, best practices, and constantly refresh the users about the best thing to do in this environment. Lately, of course, we have other areas of risk. Uh, with the birth of uh, what we call blockchain 2.0 or Ethereum, smart contracts came about. And guess what? Smart contracts are pieces of code. Typically in a piece of code, you have a vulnerability for, or a bug for every thousand lines of code, and you have one critical vulnerability for every 10,000 lines of code. So if you have a very large smart contract, there's chances there are things that are not correct or could be putting your smart contract at risk. So that really means it created a whole new field of cybersecurity. It was the field to audit the smart contracts and make sure that they are safe, that there's no risks associated with them because the smart contracts run 100% in the blockchain. So that means there's no way to stop in the middle of their execution unless you kind of freeze the entire blockchain. Now there's new updatable smart contracts. So, I mean, the, the technology evolved and obviously this gave birth to a whole new world. I sometimes call this world the world of the virtual bank or other people call it DeFi or distributed finance. Again, still in the early days, although it's been around for four years plus, it's really in the last one or two years that it's actually got a lot of traction. But with this attention comes risk due to security. So obviously this needs to be addressed in a structured way to, so the business of auditing smart contracts became very serious and very real. That's really cool. And I would love to, so you were talking about a few solutions. You said like, if it's a firmware related attack, make sure that your computer is always updated. Do you have any tips for these different categories for the social engineering, a tip for people to avoid phishing, maybe a tip for people to avoid the SIM swap and all that different, what are, what are some general tips that on top of, well, of I, course, taking courses? I have a, correct, I have a few YouTube videos on all these topics. So I invite you to either go to YouTube or to SlideShare and the tips are exactly there. But uh, we run a lot of security awareness classes where we distribute these tips, these practices, these best practices, and we have to constantly refresh them because the hackers are always one step ahead. You know, Dubai, is obviously the land of opportunity. Lots of startups, lots of innovation, but with that also comes a lot of scammers trying to make a, a lot of money very quickly. There's been obviously very advanced scams that have been created where somebody uh, comes to you and says, oh, I have a multi-million dollar uh, USDT wallet, you know, okay, I want it and I need to cash some of it out. So, oh, but they give you a very good discount that you, you could, not unbelievable, good chance are it's not real and it's a scam. And what they've been doing is simply they created an alternate USDT with a different smart contract address, the person sends, receives, and then they can have, never cash out this money because it's actually fake USDT, but they exchange it for cash, so the cash is long gone. So really, it's a cybersecurity is... Um, process. It's not like a one-time thing. You need to constantly refresh it with new best practices to get the best awareness of what is the latest threats. And those threats are new at every iteration. 
So that's really fascinating, George. You were talking about like how the smart contract opened up to new like security flaws and stuff like that. So, you know, when we look at, you're talking about DeFi as well. When you look at farming on DeFi and all these yielding lending products, is it safe to say that none of them are completely secure and that we're still too early to really have a completely secure platform? Or are there some where you feel like from a cybersecurity standpoint, okay, this is very unlikely for it to, to crash or to get hacked? First, there's several issues today with DeFi. One of them is definitely the level of maturity. DeFi is still in its early stages, and we can call it baby steps. Some systems are 100% DeFi. That means they operate without any backend system. That means they don't need the cloud storage or a cloud computing environment to function. So definitely, though, anything that is 100% DeFi will be in a better position. So yes, there is a few that have reached this level of maturity, but it's a small percentage. The ones that still need a backend system, that means if that backend system could be Google Cloud, Amazon, does not really matter, goes down, that means your entire DeFi project can easily crash or stop functioning or give very low performance or otherwise. So you need to have, uh, apart from just um, cybersecurity, one of the key elements is what we call business continuity, which is the availability of the system or the scalability of the system. So if you cannot meet user demand, and as you know, in Ethereum, sometimes we have challenges with performance, especially when the network gets clogged and there's too many transactions because it can only perform so many transactions per second. So these DeFi only projects are dependent on the scalability of that network. So there's still some, a bit of Achilles heel and the entire system. But as we move forward, I see the progress uh, being done is extremely good. And I think the potential is there in the next uh, six months, one year, two years to have really something solid in terms of creating a whole new generation of uh, digital banks and um, basically virtual, or sometimes we call them neo banks or distributed finance applications that are able to return yield to users and create new generation of financial products. Which which of these financial products matters the most to you in DeFi? Is it yield like you mentioned, or is there a particular sector? I know asset tokenization is something that you're really interested in. It's really a combination. I mean, I think yield is important, but I think what matters definitely in DeFi is what I usually call use case. So when you have good use cases that have proper adoption and proper application, then you get growth. So, so where does the growth come from? The growth comes from the user community. So if you have created a solution that has a good user community, then obviously you are in a position uh, to, 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 to benefit from this growth. So I see the future is extremely positive. Um, now, obviously DeFi still has one area, as you mentioned, that needs to be addressed. And I, I believe the next growth of DeFi is gonna come not just from virtual to virtual. So I believe when we tie the virtual world with the real asset world, which could be what we sometimes refer to as asset tokenization, this will take DeFi to another level. Now, what are the kind of assets that uh, we can definitely tokenize? We can tokenize gold, can tokenize uh, silver, these are, uh, one type of commodities or diamonds, but we can also tokenize things that the Middle East understands extremely well. This could be real estate, uh, this could be um, valuable watches or pieces of art or artifacts. So all of these have the capacity to have guaranteed growth or appreciation over time. So if there's a tie-in between this physical world and the virtual world through a proper wrapping, now, that also means that DeFi eventually will need to address a second element of weakness, which is sometimes what we call compliance and governance. As you know, some of the projects today are not really applying the proper KYC or know your own customer or AML, uh, anti-money laundering, or sometimes factor regulations or others. So those over time become also important to give traction and credibility and lower risk to the opera operation of the project. So in terms of this asset tokenization, you know, obviously there was a case in New York where people could buy like a fraction of a hotel. If you thought that that room was maybe a suite and you want a fraction, own a, a fraction of that a suite, you could do it. 
so is so my first question is is fractional investing one of the interesting aspects of asset tokenization and obviously this ties well with nfts because you talked about art maybe collectibles maybe cars and one last question sorry george there's so many is do we have to use some sort of iot devices to make sure that we connect the real world the tangent world as you said with the virtual world and how can we create a system where we use blockchain but also we can verify that that is the real object okay lots of questions, yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> let me try to remember all that and go Sorry. one by one first let's address the issue of real estate tokenization one of the earlier projects that got traction and got a lot of visibility which was the St. Regis Hotel in Aspen. It was done by a colleague of ours from Israel and um, Solid Block, and they were very popular. Uh, and it proved that the, the approach actually works. That means people, it was mostly institutional investors, but yes, it did introduce the concept of fractional ownership. It also, also introduced the concept and the importance of liquidity and the capability of uh, transact so you can buy and sell your tokens even before the hotel is actually built. So that means it provides a much greater degree of um, transfer of wealth from one individual to the other. The second area that you mentioned, NFTs, is actually a particular area that definitely has got, got a lot of growth in the last one or two years. There's many areas. Of course, there was Cryptic Kitties, which was a little bit fun, but also profitable for some people. Actually, a lot of the NFTs came from the gaming world. So yeah. people play games, yeah. they get a superpowers or they get a, a weapon sword, or a yeah. sword. <laughs> and then this sword is identified by NFT and then you can trade. So it becomes yeah. a market for these. But beyond that, there's many other applications. One of the latest one is uh, football cards. Yeah. Uh, very similar to the old days where we had baseball cards. So if the football card is from a famous player, the guy's got very good uh, attraction on the market, then this card becomes more valuable because it's unique. Again, you can trade it as a piece of art. Now, we can also tokenize the real art. Uh, it could be a painting like Mona Lisa or other. So that really means uh, the NFT works in combination with the art or is even the art itself. In some cases, it's the art. In other cases, is an identifier of uniqueness to the art. There's other cases where the NFT is also being used to identify valuable objects, like, for example, a Rolex watch or others. So that means it becomes kind of, you can say, the serial number of that object of luxury. So there's many luxury brands that have explored and are using today NFT so that you can use the NFT to validate that that luxury object is actually real and not a fake one. So the NFT is actually taking off and I see lots of future applications. The last one that you talked is even more interesting because of my cybersecurity, my Huawei background, my you know 5G IoT. Yes, we are now also combining the IoT technology. And IoT has got a very interesting aspect. That really means that we can now put an IoT sensor on the valuable object. Uh, could be a piece of art, uh, could be a luxury item, um, could be, for example, uh, an artifact, like an expensive vase. But guess what? It could even be a bar of gold. So this identifies this as being unique. And because you're using IoT, you want to know that bar of gold is still stored in the location where it was, so you can mix IoT with GPS, GPS technology. technology. So this ensures that that bar of gold is still in its original location. Now, you have this tokenized, so now you no longer have just the tokenization aspect, but have you have IoT to add extra layers of trust and extra layers of security so that the people that have invested in that, you no longer need the middleman to do the periodic audits to see is it still really there. Now, IoT cannot be applied to everything. I mean, let's assume you have one of those big buildings like we have here behind us, <laughs> putting an IoT sensor to make sure the building is there, <laughs> it's still not a realistic thing. But I do believe that IoTs because of their, or IoT sensors because of their practical approach is very useful combined with NFTs in smaller objects to identify that they exist, they're the real ones, and they still exist where they're supposed to be. That's so interesting. And that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Like, what is another piece of technology that we would need to be able to invest and buy these things, trade these things? And 
the, 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 the actual GPS makes so much sense because like you said, you know, with the IoT sensor and the blockchain, you know, the, the what it is, you know, you know, who like who is behind it, who owns it. But the where for the where question, you would need a GPS if you're if you don't have it physically at your house or somewhere. In Correct. Your one of the important things about um, IoT, especially when we move to the world of 5G, one of the things that got created as part of 5G is something known as narrow band IoT. What it really means, instead of transmitting massive amounts of information, like we have typically in 5G, gigabytes of information, narrow band IoT is driven by a battery, and this battery can last up to three or five years, or sometimes even more, and the battery is included in the IoT sensor. And guess what? This IoT sensor can talk directly with the cellular tower. So that means you're no longer dependent on gateways and gateways to ensure that the object is there. So you can get the GPS location of this IoT sensor directly from the cellular tower. So it goes from object to cellular tower to monitoring station, which talks directly to the telecom organization. That really means that the 5G is kind of a fiber over the air that connects all this data and it establishes a much more useful cloud. And guess what this does? It, that's what brings us the smart cities which is one of the interesting applications of this entire technology. That just shows, you know, how promising, like you said, we can find a way to really connect the virtual world and, and the tangible world or the real world, if you quote unquote. Correct. But, uh, but George, it's been amazing talking to you. We've covered cybersecurity, we covered DeFi farming, we covered NFTs, asset tokenization, and so many amazing topics. And I was so happy to have you on the show. By the way, you have an awesome meetup as well, if you want to share it with the community in case they come to Dubai. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, about two years ago, we started something called EchoX. This stands for Ecosystem Connections. And we know that the people usually come to buy, do Dubai, they're entrepreneurs, they want to be successful. But in any business, you need several elements to be successful. And I usually call it, from one of my best friends, called MBC, it stands for money, brains and contacts. <laughs> so the guys come with the idea, you need typically two things, financing or connections Connection. to actually reach the audience or the business you're trying to develop. So this is why we created EchoX. It's basically an accelerator to your business. And what we do for the last two years, we have had weekly meetings, sometimes on Monday, sometimes on Tuesday nights, and people get to meet face to face. And when you meet face to face, we have also virtual ones, we have started on Clubhouse, we have Zooms, we have also ones online with a community that we have created, but this allows us to establish a trusted relationship and a trusted ecosystem. It was great, I experienced it three times, I met amazing people. So if you guys are in Dubai and you need to connect with the local community, George Sebastian, is that is it good? Yes. Uh, is definitely one of these guys who's helping grow the community locally. He also has a YouTube channel, we'll put everything in the description box below. If you like this interview, don't forget to like, comment, and blast that bell notification so you can get access to more of these timeless interviews. Don't forget to join us every single Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, eight o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys. Mm -hmm.